So good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us. My name is Todd Probert. I'm the president of National Security and Innovative Solutions for CACI. Many of you heard CNO Franchetti's keynote this morning. In fact, I, I worked with my comms guy to get uh, better walk-up music here, but he, he failed me on that one. But the three points that stood out to me were EW, cyber, and redefining conflict. The Navy is prioritizing ways to expand the reach, depth, and lethality of the fleet to include unmanned systems. And industry must partner closely with the Navy to rapidly close critical capability gaps in today's competitive environment. We stand ready to support those priorities. My portfolio at CACI focus on, focuses on developing world-class technology across the C4ISR domains from EW to cybersecurity to oper operations and resiliency in space. Maintaining techno technological advantage in these areas is crucial to the U.S. Navy and our partners and allies in conflicts across the globe. They must have the tools they need to operate effectively in today's contested multi-domain battlefields. We have decades of mission software development experience enhancing and securing critical systems that advance speed to decision making and situational awareness. Software underpins everything we do, allowing us to rapidly deliver tools that are relevant for the fights we are facing. Also, we have a broad portfolio that features investments made ahead of need for systems that provide resilient RF and communication solutions. For, examples, we have ex for example, we have expertise in areas like counter C5 ISR and T and EW. A great example of this is Spectral, the program we are working on with the U.S. Navy, which will build and field next generation shipboard SIGINT, IO, and EW systems for tactical mission operations. Advances in these areas are critical for the joint all-domain force environment, and they need to be developed in a way that they can be employed effortlessly, supporting readiness and warfighting advantage. Today's panel is titled The Digital Battlefield, How Electronic and Cyber Warfare Are Shaping Tomorrow's Battle Space. With that theme in mind, we're going to discuss current and future solutions to specifically help address the Navy's challenges in EW, Cyber, and SIGINT. The distinguished individuals on the stage with me are uniquely positioned to discuss the current threat environment and speak to potential solutions that give our sailors the edge in this highly contested EW space. As we all know, the dynamic, ever-expanding nature of the EW threat requires future-proofed solutions. For example, I am sure we are all aware that the readiness of tomorrow's EW SIGINT and cyber capabilities will require AI and ML-based innovations, and we'll talk about that a little bit. And frankly, and maybe most importantly, to achieve all of this, industry and government must work closely together on solutions that ensure that we are best prepared for the involving threat. So let's get into it. Um, I, in the interest of time, I'm going to have each of these fine gentlemen uh, introduce themselves and give a little bit of, uh, of how they're relevant to this discussion. But I want to say out of the gate, I'm honored to have these four guys up here with me and humbled to share the stage with them. So uh, Admiral Fogo, let's, uh, let's start with you. Hey, thanks very much, Todd, and uh, what a pleasure to be here, ladies and gents. Thanks for coming to the uh, Marine Corps Theater today. My name is uh, uh, Jamie Fogo. I did uh, 39 and a half years in the United States Navy, and you can categorize that career by three 12s plus four. So uh, I interviewed with Admiral Rickover, and then I did 12 years underwater, uh, about 12 years in the Pentagon, including naval reactors, but I consider that uh, just like being in the Pentagon. Let me tell you, 12 years in the Pentagon was like 12 years underwater. <laughs> and then uh, 12 of the best years of my life, uh, I commanded nine times overseas, uh, primarily dual-hatted in uh, NATO U.S. billets, and the rest of it was uh, training and schools. And so delighted to be here with you today. I've been retired for three years, and I'm now the Dean of the Center for Maritime Strategy of the Navy League of the United States. TJ? Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Admiral, for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be with you today. My name is TJ White. I retired three years ago. Uh, as the commander of Fleet Cyber Command, 10th Fleet, and at the time Navy Space. Um, I commanded not as often or as well as Admiral Fogo, and I can't talk about it because it was all classified. <laughs> it's a great pleasure to be with you today, and I look forward to the dialogue. Thanks, TJ. Admiral Trussler. Hi, my name is Jeff Trussler. I've only been retired four months. 
uh, after 39 years. Uh, Submariner like Admiral Fogo, uh, my last job is the Deputy Chief of Naval Operations for uh, Information Warfare and uh, very happy to be here. Uh, thank you, Khaki, for putting this on. And uh, thank you, Khaki, for the free socks. Awesome, the awesome. That made it all worth coming. You said you were going to wear them, though, so we got to got to shift uh, in mid-flight there. Okay, last but not least, Admiral Druggan. Hey, thank you, CACI, for sponsoring <coughs> this today. Important conversation. Um, I served on five destroyers um, over 10 years at sea. Uh, went to, into acquisition there. I was major program manager twice. I was the commander as a flag officer of the Naval Surface Warfare Centers. And then I finished up as the program executive at Aegis BMD in the Missile Defense Agency. Ashore, I worked a uh, 2000 QDR and then <coughs> Navy Operations Group, also known as Deep Blue. We stood that up after 9 11, and then special assistant to Vice Chief Mull and Vice Chief um, Nath uh, Black and Black Nathan, and then uh, CNO. Okay. So, so let's get into it. Um, got a couple of questions to ask the panel, and then uh, we're going to reserve about 15 minutes at the end, on a minimum, uh, to get some audience questions in as well. So I'm sure that's going to be uh, the most interesting part. But first question uh, for Admiral Fogo. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the global conflicts that are currently underway and some of the associated threats that we're seeing. I'd like to start with the aggressive behaviors we're seeing in Ukraine, the Red Sea, and Israel, and the types of tactics that are being used around electronic warfare and the electronic electromagnetic spectrum. What should we be looking for, what should we be looking out for as industry to best support these conflicts? Yeah, thanks very much, Todd. That's a great question. And you know, as I woke up this morning, ladies and gents, uh, there are several headlines out there, and uh, one of them caught my eye. It said, uh, Navy is drowning in the sands of the Middle East. I don't know if some of you read that article. And uh, you know, I asked myself, hey, what are we supposed to do? Uh, if you don't do anything, you get the heat, uh, and if you do magnificent things like we're doing right now, you get even more heat. Uh, I've talked about this uh, particular scenario uh, in the Red Sea and the ramifications uh, there with a couple of times in the last month on CBS and once with the Council on Foreign Relations. So I'm familiar with the issue, even though I've been retired for three years, and the problem is the bad guys, the Houthis, are making us go around the Cape of Good Hope. That's increasing transit times 10 days. 12% of our trade goes through the uh, Suez and the Bab el Mendeb and the Red Sea. 10% of our oil, 8% of our gas, and about 30% uh, of our containers. You heard Admiral Frank Kennedy this morning say we've knocked down 70 drones and 20 uh, air-breathing missiles, cruise missiles. I think that's magnificent. And I'd like to just, in light of that article, take a moment to ask you to recognize the USS Mason, Gravely, Kearney, Laboon, and Hudner. I think they're doing a hell of a job. And would you please give them a round of applause? <laughs> we just think we get inflation under wraps, and now uh, containers are going up to about six, $7,000 per container. Uh, that's going to impact your pocketbook. Uh, going around, like I said, is an additional 10 days. And oh, by the way, we're burning more fuel. And for those of you who think the way I do, that's a big impact on carbon footprint. So how do we knock down all these drones and all these missiles? You know, a couple of my uh, young lieutenants are now commanding officers of uh, destroyers, one on the Gravely and the other one here in San Diego who I talked to on Chafee. And we're using SM2 missiles, 5-inch 54 guns, Sea Whiz, Sea Ram. So an SM-2 is about a $2 million missile against a $10,000 drone. Brendan McLean said it best when, you know, he pointed out at SNA, look, you want to hit that missile with, uh, or you want to hit that drone with an SM-2 or let it get through and hit a $100 million tanker, have it sink in the Bab el Mandeb, clog up traffic like uh, we did during Evergreen a year ago, and, uh, and create an environmental problem. I don't think so. Uh, so this is a cost-imposing strategy on us at a time where ordnance is uh, critical in our inventory and in our supply chains. So what are the lessons learned from the Red Sea? And Todd alluded to it. You know, what can we do better? What can we do in electronic warfare? And that's the purpose of this panel today. Certainly, we could add directed energy, but I don't think the Navy is there. We put systems out on Ponce and on uh, Dewey, and we've had them there for years, and we're trying to get that fast-tracked and forward. But uh, we can do more with electronic warfare, and in particular, instead of knocking down Artemis's arrows all the time, we need to go after 
uh, the launcher and after the archer. So the bottom line up front, I think, is in this kill chain that we always talk about, we got to get left of launch. Uh, furthermore, it took us until January. This thing started with Carney in October 19th when they knocked down a couple missiles headed to Israel and some drones. Uh, it took us until January to get on the ground to go after the Houthis uh, where we thought their launchers were. Um, what about the use of cyber bullets? Practically free. We know how to do that. We need a better common operating picture. There's a lot of these launchers we used to call TELs that are moving around all the time. We need to be able to get uh, a better sense of where they are. And the way to do that is to figure out how to do processing, evaluation, and dissemination better. And I think uh, this group up here and you in particular, Todd, have done some great work there. Uh, one of the things we have to do is figure out how to bring exquisite, very high level uh, intelligence you know, I'm talking at the TS and compartmented level, down to the level of the warfighter. The sailors on those ships don't really give a damn what the source is. You know, we always worry about sources and methods. They just want the data so they can put it into the algorithm and fire control and do whatever they need to do to neutralize the threat. So I think we've got some challenges there, but I think we can overcome those challenges to make our CICs, combat information centers, more effective. Got to flatten the sensor to shooter architecture. You know, I started my first congressional commission in 1994. That was one of the goals, and we're still not there yet. But there's a lot of uh, positive things happening today, and you heard about it here. Every speaker, I've been to the fleet commanders, the type commanders, and Admiral Franchetti, and from the time she started this morning, it was all about that. Uh, we also need to update our signals libraries and figure out how to do that better so that the best information is uh, prevalent on board the ship for the, for the uh, sailors to use. Uh, when I was an ensign, I can remember the excitement of Commander Meese, later Admiral Meese, Lieutenant Commander Byrd, later Vice Admiral Byrd, telling me, go to Periscope Depth, we're gonna do a over-the-air transfer of crypto. It's the first time we ever tried it on a submarine. I'm up in the North Atlantic with the antenna up, and we're just doing this for about four hours, going back and forth with everybody getting seasick. We didn't have the bandwidth to do it. We can do that today, and I'm really impressed with some of the things that you guys are doing and PEO IWS are doing to split out the and virtualize the combat system, get hardware separate from software, go to COTS for the hardware. You don't have to uh, drill a hole in a hull and do the transfer of updates and upgrades over the air. Every one of those ships out there in the Red Sea should be baseline nine. I can tell you, when I was in Naples and was in command of those ships in Rota and FDNF, they were not. So let me stop there and turn over to my esteemed colleagues uh, and see if there's anything they want to say about that. Okay, back yeah, to Yeah, hey, well, so a long list. Um, yeah. But uh, I guess I, my takeaway, long list, a lot of it comes down to leveraging new technologies, putting more at the speed of software and driving that cognitive uh, that cognitive workload down to something that we can go do at machine speed and, and driving through that. Uh, going after the Archer, uh, working cyber bullets into the, uh, the the magazine depth challenge and the cost to, uh, to kill challenge, uh, a better common operating picture, uh, and then really how do you go uh, move into the future with over-the-air updates and, and really given an inter evergreen platform on every, those sh every one of those ships as the threat evolves and you can go tackle it. So fantastic, fantastic coverage of, of what we're seeing and I appreciate that. Let's let's move on to uh, Admiral Tressler uh, for this next one. So I'd like to shift to another area now and, and highlight a trend we are seeing around China's increasing military capabilities. What does this mean for credible military deterrence and what should we be looking for in terms of technology to stay ahead of the China situation? <coughs> Sir. You know, that's a, that's a very interesting question. How, how do you measure deterrence and the, uh, the erosion of credible military deterrence? So I think sometimes we have, uh, we suffer from the problem of measuring the easily measurable. And uh, as we're talking about combat power and everything else. So right now it's very easy uh, for us to uh, count ships with China, count ships with the United States. Uh, count ships in the Western Pacific versus what you know worldwide. You know, there you can just—it's—it's it's too easy. It's too simplistic. But how do you how do you measure the deterrence level or effect of say cyber or, or EW electronic warfare? And how do how do we know 
has it worked? Because uh, most of the time we're not publicly discussing what we have in place. So I always look at that as, as a very difficult question. A recent example of maybe how we've done that, if, uh, if you've been reading the news the last couple of weeks, the National Security Agency released a cybersecurity advisory about Volt Typhoon that talked about uh, the Chinese, the PRC, uh, positioning themselves in U.S., mainland, Guam, and other critical infrastructure, working very hard to try to hold us at risk. Hmm. So why did why did we all of a sudden come out with that advisory? Uh, not sure how long we've been tracking it. We, we can't talk about that. If they've been tracking it from day one, they won't say that. If they just figured it out, they won't say that. We're not going to know. But for some reason, we decided, the United States, we're going to put that out and hold up the fact that we know this actor called Volt Typhoon is trying to hold our critical infrastructure at risk. So somewhere in that itself is a piece of deterrence, possibly. Hard to measure. Now, my team that's back here uh, that I used to just work with, they're going to they're gonna, they're gonna hoot and holler when I say the radio frequency spectrum. Okay, The electronic, uh, electromagnetic spectrum of radio frequency is going to be uh, on fire should we go to combat the deterrence of what we have versus level of, versus what they have it's going to be hard to measure it's hard for us to test it's hard for us to demonstrate to ourselves because once you reveal capability then the adversary can start working towards it so that both in the cyber world and in the electromagnetic spectrum, uh, spectrum, that is very difficult to develop your capability, demonstrate it to yourselves so that you can use it without revealing yourself. What I will say about the radio frequency spectrum and things we can do is, by God, do not take it away from the Department of Defense. Uh, the administration uh, is trying uh, to support industry to make our lives better. It is a 21st century first world problem where industry wants more of the radio frequency spectrum that has been allocated to the Department of Defense, specifically the 3.1 to 3.45 gigahertz. That's where some of our prime, for many decades, systems have been developed and operated. So to all of a sudden turn around and say, we're gonna, we can share it, or we could give up a little bit. You don't use it all that much anyway. That's the area where we train, test, demonstrate to ourselves our credible capability. So uh, senators recently wrote to the administration and said, uh, hey, we're really nervous about your continued movement forward and your desire to share or uh, kick the DOD out of certain spectrums. Very, do very well documented, lots of articles on there about it. But that's a real issue for the Department of Defense and what we're doing. So in this decade uh, where a uh, decade of decision, uh, a decade that we're really concerned about conflict with China, we're doing a lot of things as a whole of government that make it challenging for the department to get ready for that potential uh, all-domain conflict. Thank you. Anybody else want to jump in? Okay, wow. Some, uh, some heady takeaways from, from that. I, I, uh, I come away with asymmetric. I come away with undersensed. Come away with underpracticed, and come away with uh, impingement from from the broader commercial or or, or other uh, other non war fighting functions to to the ability of of us to do our collective job in China, and it's um it it, it adds to the list of. Uh, of, of tough things to, to go tackle on Ad Admiral Fogo's list from our first question as well. So um, I see we're building we're building the challenge set. Um, hopefully we can we can move forward into solutions too as we get to the latter questions. But let's move on to uh, to Admiral White. Um, with these dynamic global conflicts, we are seeing much a much more accelerated pace of technological change and the expanding impact on the information environment. Outpacing these threats is of vital importance in the EW and cyber domains. What are some of the barriers that we are facing to stay ahead of, and how do you feel about the host of innovation, innovation efforts currently underway within the DOD, and will they undercome some of these challenges? Thanks for the question. I think it's very important. Uh, I started my career 
40 years ago as a SWO on a battleship. Uh, on the last six months of that tour on a deployment during Desert Shield, Desert Storm, uh, I had two Silkworm cruise missiles, well, the ship had two Silkworm cruise missiles shot at it. And because we owned the Spectrum, because we could see the Spectrum, because we could sense the Spectrum, because we could make decisions about the Spectrum, and because we had a really good partner and ally in the Brits on our starboard quarter, that threat was entirely neutralized. It ended up being a non-event, but it was a real event uh, in our minds because we had the chance to do something about the threat. That was also the sensor kill chain with intelligence community support at the national level, and at the time, a pretty well integrated uh, tactical chain now known as a kill web or something like that, whatever the buzzword is. I'm a big fan of battleships. Their time has come and gone. I'm a big fan of what it taught me about the value of an analog mechanical wristwatch so that if the spectrum goes away or my power goes away, I'll at least know what time it is on my bad day. I'm also a big fan of the data when I choose to look at it and sometimes make no decision about the bad story it's telling me with the low number of steps or other bad indicators for my mindfulness, wellness, and health lifestyle choices. We do not do innovation well in the DOD. More specifically, we don't accept and embrace innovation well. The Navy has been a giant innovation machine throughout its history. In my mind, the challenge is that the adversaries have caught up, and they are doing innovation at least as well as we are, and they are culturally prepared to embrace it. Sometime that comes as a fiat from leadership, as a you will under compellence. I don't think that their command of the technology is better than ours. I do think that they are probably uh, uptaking and embracing technology at scale faster than we are. Uh, but I, it is not all glum, okay? Industry has the opportunity and they have a mechanism called IRAD. And all of those innovation engines known in the private sector, I think can deliver, have delivered, should deliver. And there are some things that are in the way with the process, whether it's you know, the budget or the budgeting process or legislation or congressional resolutions, yeah. But we know that that has been and likely will be the environment. Uh, so I think that the Navy and the department could perhaps assert itself. Some of my sage mentors and colleagues on the left and right will explain to me after the fact why that will be a battle that we won't fight. But it doesn't mean that we won't win, but it's not one that we shouldn't fight. Okay, in spectrum. Okay, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, it's going to be on fire and that it might, in fact, be gone. And so I do think that the Navy is going to have to figure out how to do operations the way we all grew up at our age, thinking about being alone, unafraid, over the horizon, and operating under mission command. And what we can field at sea, whether it's on a submarine, or whether it's on a surface ship, whether it's with an aviation wing, we're gonna have to figure it out. And I'm confident all those operators, in fact, will do that. Uh, Jeff, you brought up uh, Volt Typhoon. And I think that that is reflective of what the Chinese are prepared to do. Advanced force operations, if that's what you wanna call it. Operational prep of the environment, if that's what you wanna call it. Uh, positioning, pre-positioning, if that's what you wanna call it. But the reason they can do it, no matter what you call it, is because of convergence in the analog and digital world and the fact that we are now operating under executable code via software and processors that are connected by design and by choice. We pay for it, it doesn't cost a lot because all of our lives we think are made better and more convenient and a lot easier. And so I do think that one of the innovations that we're gonna to have to figure out and war game is what does deprivation look like? Whether it's in spectrum or something else. And in that opportunity, I think we will have sailors and goat lockers and commanding officers and wardrooms and fleet commanders that are just gonna do it the way they've always done it, which is 
with intense focus, creative energy, good leadership. Um, I'm really, really concerned about what Volt Typhoon represents. And I think that companies like Khaki and others, <clears throat> you're in the sensor business, bring your sensors to bear everywhere that the United States interests are and their economic prosperity is generated. Those two things together are now the definition of our national security. And it is global. We don't have two oceans separating us or protecting us. Hey, so fantastic answer. Uh, maybe one follow-up. Uh, so, so at CACI, we're big at driving investment ahead of need. The spectral contract that I uh, that I mentioned, we went through numerous iterations of a kind of an MVP with the Navy leadership before we got to where we're at. However, that often is not the norm, and um, I. I be interested in your advice to industry with regard to um, a lot of the conversations I have in terms of the, the need for a particular capability or not are really not technologically limited. limited. They're con ops limited or history limited or culture limited or, or, or any of that. So how do we increase the speed of innovation to the fleet as we go through this? Yeah, two things. Uh, my colleague, General Reynolds, made an observation in the last couple days about we need to embrace this idea of combat culture. We need to apply that to spectrum. We need to apply that to the way that we do weapon system design and innovation. Uh, and I think the second thing, industry, you ought to stand on the table and demand that your customer and the government, the Navy, deliver to you really good requirements. They know how to do that. And I just think that sometimes those requirements are not as well written and crafted uh, as they could be. So insist on a damn good requirement. Yeah, fair. It's definitely a partnership and we need to we need to come to the middle together. So, no, great, thanks. Okay, let's go, uh, sorry. Oh, you for your comment. Yeah. yeah, so I think uh, when you have a military organization that tries to institutionalize innovation, you end up stifling innovation. So that's why you have to go outside. And, uh, you know, that's why DIU, I think, is, uh, is a good idea and Doug Beck is working that. Uh, somebody that we know uh, where I work at the Center for Maritime Strategy. I think Replicator is looking for solutions that are coming from the outside and those solutions are being accepted or down selected. That's good. Uh, one example interesting, I was up in New York on Friday and how do we better fight these magnificent ships that are sailing around in the Red Sea. Um, there's a company called uh, Next Jump that's broken the paradigm of uh, US business schools. You know, you go to business school and you study case studies and then you get your MBA and you get some venture capital and you go take this new idea and try to do an IPO and make millions of dollars. So after the case studies, they tell you, go find a guy who's an entrepreneur, like the guy who invested 200,000 in Google and made four billion, talk to him. And you spend an hour talking to this person and they give you nothing but platitudes. So as a substitute for that, uh, this company brings people in, entrepreneurs, and they have them talk as fast as they can, 300 words a minute, into a microphone. It's an otter-like device about every idea they ever had and how they want to make a killing with their uh, IPO. And then afterwards, artificial intelligence and the algorithm analyzes it, puts it in plain English, and spits it back to them. And most of them are astonished that their idea could be expressed so eloquently and so clearly. Think about something like that on the bridge of the USS Kearney while we're going through or after we've gone through the combat situation and the after action report. And you have artificial intelligence to tell you how to do it better next time. Just yeah. an idea. No, well said and, and, and most definitely interesting. Okay, so let's pivot again. So we, we started the conversation a little bit with AI. So Admiral Drogan, Given the focus on AI across the domains and the ultimate goal for, goal for AI and ML to reduce the cognitive load on humans making critical decisions, could you share a few thoughts on your peer, on peer adversary capabilities that we're seeing and on a related note, machine automation and combat engagements that we should be discussing? Absolutely, thanks. Uh, first, shaping tomorrow's battle space. Based on the speakers uh, here today, I think we can all take for granted that it's already been shaped and is being shaped every day. Ukraine, Israel, Hamas, Red Sea, who knew Houthis had anti-ship ballistic missiles, just the pervasive 
um, presence of drones a as a war fighting element, uh, certainly new, and certainly in Ukraine, uh, the use of jammers, the use of deception, maneuver, and we also know that they've enlisted their civilian population and their cell phones to, to, be, to be part of a state network for defense against drones. That's all happened in the past six months. And uh, so there's a shocking amount of innovation that's happening uh, on the battlefield in the crucible of con uh, combat. When it comes to uh, AIML, to get directly at your question, I think we're gonna see an unfolding in many different ways. The services are going to use AIML and apply it in very different ways. Certainly on the reliability and maintainability of articles of war, that is probably an excellent entry point for AIML for people to get educated and comfortable with the technology. And then we'll move up into um, our information networks. Individual ships as, a, um, as an integer, a fighting integer is one thing. Being able to tap multi-ship capability will be the next level for us to be able to do as we take AI, ML, apply it to the networks, really to fuse the sensor data so that we're smarter consumers of the potential threats that are out there, as well as what's not a threat. Um, as we move into, uh, then you get into kinetics and non-kinetics. This is where electronic warfare, both passive and active and cyber warfare can play an important role, particularly on the EW side. You can have an automated response, a highly automated response with the EW, and given that it's range and local effects, um, and the ability to focus on your target of interest, a fully automated response may be very appropriate where a kinetic, you know, an SM-2 missile launch, for instance, or an SM-6, would not be. So it provides the commanding officer, it provides the warfighting commander, the fleet commander options that they would not otherwise have in terms of an automated response. That's important for the defense of our assets, whether ashore or at sea. Unfortunately, after all that sensor data is being fused and, and you know, the CAOC has it, national command centers have it. Um, unfortunately, our expeditionary forces are only gonna be able to see a little tiny piece just based on bandwidth. And consequently, the application of AI ML at the tactical level, I think is much harder. And your challenge is bridging enterprise level solutions to service level solutions to community service or community level solutions down to expeditionary tactical, whether it's Humvees, trucks, ships at sea, aircraft, uh, and being able to move that data around. That's one of the reasons space becomes really important to our future. And the proliferated low earth orbit ability of us to move data around to end users, just the amount, not overwhelm them, but what they need and, and what they can use uh, is really going to become important and a war fighting advantage, an asymmetric advantage if we do it correctly. And out of all of this, as we use AI and ML to really augment the human in the beginning by fusing the sensor data, providing war fighting options without execution, and the human decides, we can really get to a level of centaur combat that's powered by the machine but with the creativity and the judgment of the human that's necessary in the beginning. Uh, in Aegis, we, we are fortunate, and I think in Navy in general, to have a culture um, where we ha already have some level of rules-based doctrine. We have it for identification, we have it for uh, release of weapons, and it's many, many different levels, uh, all within the rules of engagement set by the combatant commander. So certainly in the service Navy, and I believe also in uh, naval aviation, those different levels and having to make conscious decisions of moving from self-defense to area defense to force defense be become very natural. And I'm very thankful not only for Aegis Baseline 9 Charlie and 5-4 that Admiral Fogo mentioned, but also for the weapons tactics instructor program that was set up under Admiral Roden and Admiral Kilby uh, uh, almost a decade ago. That has given us the tactical expertise and I am thankful for that today because otherwise the situation in the Red Sea may have started very differently. Now when it comes to electronic warfare and cyber warfare, your challenge as industry is where do you take your product? All right, and you may have a wonderful, incredible piece of hardware that is exquisite 
if only you had the signals intelligence to feed it. And yet, you may not be able to get that. That's an organizational barrier that we have to work on. We have acquisition barriers, right, where, that are unfortunately long and t probably take a little bit too much time, certainly. Um, uh, today, though, it, at least in a number of organizations uh, across all the services, there are other transaction authorities, there are demonstrations, there is prototyping, um, and there's fleet prototyping of unmanned, new EW capability. Um, all of that is our, our new entry points that really were not available a couple years ago. So that's the good news. Uh, the more difficult challenge is any enterprise solution is a difficult sell given that we're many services and uh, many uh, communities within those services. And typically our, our acquisition arm of DOD doesn't cro cut across those. The exception for that is sometimes on the joint staff or at the combatant commands, of course. Um, so in terms of electronic and cyber warfare, the last thing I would say is the future is rich with technical possibilities. We are just barely scratching by statics and multi-statics of passive information. That becomes really important as the Navy moves into distributed maritime operations where we have to be able to deceive, we have to be able to maneuver, and we have to be able to do it to some extent unseen, at least when we really need to be. And being able to tap into the passive side of electronic warfare and yet have an accurate picture, both air and ground, is invaluable to our future operations. Uh, and finally, on the active side, um, just uh, active, absolutely critical. Is it a replacement for uh, kinetic interceptors? I personally do not believe so. And the reason I don't is just short range. It's short range. And you only have so many transmitters in your active side. So layered defense has served the United States Navy very, very well for decades now. And we're, we're in a good spot if we continue with that philosophy and that, that design and architecture of armament on ships. The last thing I'd like to say is when it comes to um, that network of information on the sensor side that can then grow into helping the command and control side and potentially in the future get to kinetic. Again, in, we're, we, we can do full kinetic today, but it's a rules-based. The question on AIML is maintaining the chain of accountability. Today we have a chain of accountability for every weapon that is released by the United States. Every weapon. When AI and ML is making firing recommendations, they're still a human, their chain of command of accountability is maintained. What happens though, when there's a very, very, very large raid and we decide to go full auto, which was really at the end of the day, your question, my question back would be, well, who's accountable? Right, and so I think this really falls under the rules of engagement set by the combatant commander, and that will be the right and left guide rails of the level of automation we use. Uh, one on defense, pr pr pretty good authority for the commanding officer there, operating in self-defense, but offensively, uh, force orders, automated force orders, and then to what extent do we allow AIML to make those kinetic decisions? I think the human's gonna be involved for a while. Um, it's only when you get to these very extreme cases that we may have to do something a little different. Yeah. And then there's going to have to be risk acceptance at the combatant commander level. No, that's fair. And I think um, maybe if I parse the question and let's take the autonomy challenge off the table because I think you, 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 you hit that uh, well and, and good. I think what we're finding from a machine learn standpoint, it's, it's about the confidence that you have in, in the, the algorithms that you have out there. But then that gets to how are you practicing it, which gets to how are you building your machine learned algorithms, which sort of forces, uh, you gotta do your homework before there's a conflict. And, 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 and building up your body of, of, of you know, what's your threat looks like, like what environment it, is it in. And frankly, it even comes down to the compute. You know, what, do you, what platform are you using to compute that machine learned algorithm on. There's there's nuances that go into that as well. Absolutely. So, so th thoughts on that. There's a whole bunch of homework that has to happen before you can actually get to having algorithms that you can go put absolutely. to work for you. And so this, this is a rich discussion, right? Because we're not there yet. Um, and when you have the data and AI ML is working on it, um, 
where, where does it, it fit in? And the weapons release piece is one piece. Where there's rich opportunity, and you got to it a little bit in terms of the algorithms, is under the hood algorithm improvements. Taking real live data from real live assets and, and tactical units and their actual operational experience and being able to record that in high fidelity, which we have not had in large measure until recently, um, and then be able to bring that back and run the weapon system through any weapon system or a, uh, a, a fusion center to understand what the AI ML improvements could be. And then you could then also improve the algorithms, right? So that's, that's one piece of the puzzle where AI ML can certainly play a rich role in the near term. I, I think uh, if I could add, and, and I would invite anybody up here or anyone in the audience, I think the skippers of those destroyers that are out there for the last six months, I hope that what they would say is that they were not surprised by the capabilities of the threats that were detected and coming to them. That is, there was nothing new that was unseen or performed beyond and understood and previously collected and assessed performance parameter. So part of the reason why that is good is because we spend a lot of money on a very capable intelligence community that spends a lot of effort doing discovery of bad guy capability. And one of the things I would observe about some of the successes that Cyber Command and others have had, SOCOM and others, is that they walk the talk and they play forward, they collect forward, they defend forward, and they operate forward. And I think that we're going to have to be prepared to do more and more of that if we want to make sure that yeah. our skippers are potentially never surprised by the threat environment or the weapons that are coming at them. I think that that's going to be increasingly vital to invest in that. On the AI side, I, I don't think that we're going to be able to avoid too much longer uh, an absolute imperative to get comfortable with autonomy and automated. I just, maybe in the kinetic side, we can slow it down because we will be able to see further, we can compute the data faster, so we can get yeah. and ensure that people are in the loop. I know fleet commanders and component commanders are going to really want that. They're never going to want to let that go or relax it. But I think we will need to invite the formers to be able to get, at least in principle, comfortable under what circumstances yeah. you would go, not Robo Cruiser, yeah. 1986, but you would go something different, uh, particularly in cyberspace. And I think AI is going to become increasingly important as a partner for every sailor and every commander getting comfortable yeah. with the technology. And I think the big fear is that you have a bunch of Gazintas, you have a black box, you have a Gazauta, and no one understands how the AI came up with a decision or the recommendation. So for industry and mm -hmm. academia, please consider getting into the explainable AI space. Sure particularly in training modalities, so that commanders can get a degree of confidence in where they will relax you know, their hand on the tiller and be prepared under some specified conditions to go hands off. Because if you're going to demand sensors doing things DC to light in real time at machine speed, then you need to enable the machines to fight at that speed as well. Fighting, by the way, also means defending. And I think we'll need to figure that out. Yeah, all right, so let's go down to end it, yeah. Admiral. So I, th I think we all should realize that our acquisition system is poorly suited to the procurement of AI and ML at, at the, as the way you think about it. Because how do you write the requirements? Yeah. Right? So I think we're, we're entering an age where AI can be very powerful. It's going to require wargaming by real operators yep. to understand the system. And actually, some of the requirements will be built during that wargaming yep. and not after. It's really important to understand that it's such a rich domain that none of us can predict how warfighters are going to use or not use 
the information and the recommendations and the picture that's provided by AI ML. So we so we found the uh, the exciting topic here. We should have started with AI. Real quick, Jeff, and then we'll we'll, we'll go yeah, to the audience. Uh, hey, I, maybe this is uh, too fresh from the Pentagon point of view, but we can get to a right solution the wrong way. Yeah. And all of the all of the high technology we're talking about, whether in cybersecurity, whether uh, in electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, and the CNO this morning talked about uh, wanting to get more to software to find solutions that we can rapidly upgrade. That still requires the right kind of hardware. And one of the problems we have right now, when everything that we can do, we can write requirements, we can get them right, exactly what we need to be done, but the ability to field those on ships, submarines, and aircraft, if it's going to take 10 years, it's, it's, it's just not useful. And so we have to get in the mindset, especially when writing requirements, not just the what can be done, the United States industry will solve any problem we hand it. But it's got to be done the right way so that it is usable by our fleet in a relevant time frame. And as, the, as several speakers here today, that relevant time frame is a couple of years, not 2035. Okay. No, well said, and uh, I'll come back to software to find everything, because that's been our strategy at CACI, and I think that drives a lot of what we've been talking about here. I promised you have 15 minutes of uh, audience questions. We're going we're gonna to try to achieve most of that. Any questions from the audience? Please, ma'am. Hi, Julia Marlowe, Teal Capital. Uh, so you hear a lot from the private sector folks that uh, they claim they don't get enough of a strong demand signal uh, to allow them to have any uh, viable product development. Uh, what do you recommend the DOD do differently to add more predictability uh, from a con contracting perspective, especially when you take into consideration the significant uh, mission creep and things of this nature? Gentlemen, go ahead. So um, the submariners, actually through the acoustic rapid cots insertion program, have done something along those lines. And what they do, and this is acoustic signal processing, RFs could be RF signal processing. Um, and what they've done is they set up forums where they provide unclassified data. And they provide it to many small and medium-sized businesses because they kind of have an architecture already that's maintained by a prime. And they go out, and the 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 boutique, or the boutique um, businesses and the mid-sized business, they come back and say, "Hey, I am I can I can find the signal in this noise on an unclassed sample," and so they then down select from there, and then they go and they provide them classified data, and then they work they narrow it down to a smaller field of participants, and then they provide the highest level of classification data to see whose algorithms are actually going to find the signal, the acoustic signal that's in the noise, right? And then that gets implemented, and frankly, our, it's called ARCI, the program, is a conveyor belt of capability. And it's meeting the needs of the submarine force from what I've seen on the outside uh, for um, 15, 20 years now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I would say uh, you know, our biggest problem is is the DOD operates, you said it, our acquisition system broken. Is we, we're a requirements-based organization, and we don't write requirements very well at all. And uh, we always get exactly what we have asked for. We just didn't think it was going to come that way, and then we're disappointed. And I, I've always said, and I don't know how to actually solve this, we need to sit down with industry to talk about the problems we're trying to solve by spend a year, de de year developing requirements hand to you and then be surprised at what we get because you gave us exactly what we asked for. And, and I don't know how to execute that, but it's more about defining the common problems we're trying to solve and bringing in your ideas and be more of an opportunity-based organization by a requirements-based organization. I'm still looking for the formula on how to do that, but uh, that is our fundamental challenge that slows us down. I just say the same thing on uh, acoustic rapid cuts insertion. I think that's an excellent example, Tom. And that in combination with spiral development. You know, as an ensign, I had the 113 fire control system change to the 117 fire control system. That rip out was terrible. It took the ship down and we were out of commission for months. Then the CCS Mark I, CCS Mark II with Tomahawk. And now, you know, the Virginia class uh, with Arky looks completely different. So we've got to be able to not just change class to class, but ship to ship. And that's where the spiral comes in. It's an old term, but it means the same thing. Please. Yeah, so uh, greetings, aloha to the panel. Uh, Dave McDonald, Department of the Navy, civilian, um, the CIO at NICTAM's PAC. 
wanted to piggyback a question. Uh, so Admiral White gave me permission to ask a question. He said, keep it an easy one. <laughs> um, so Admiral White, I want to kind of piggyback on your, your at least I, it was implied presumption of getting to mission command, you know, because the spectrum will be denied, critical C2 will be denied, peer or near peer adversary will be coming after everything. So the question's about, it's about our shore platforms that enable that that telecom infrastructure across the planet, whether it be shore to shore, headquarters to headquarters, or forward out to expeditionary and fleet. So, you know, Patton said in World War II, fixed fortifications are a monument to the stupidity of man. And this, this Volt Typhoon is the tip of an iceberg indicating that peer and near peer adversaries, they, they may know or aspire to know our infrastructure, our fixed fortifications better than we do. They're all targets. So the question for the panel, whoever kind of wants to handle it is, are we making the right investments in reconstitution, 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 fight through, be agile, diversity through the campaign, through the conflict, uh, don't wave the surrender flag on mission command, do we have the capacity and depth or are we investing in the capacity and depth to do that? Uh, so I'll offer an opinion. I my sense is that we're not, and it's not because we don't want to, it's because the entire department and the nation has some very hard choices it has to make. Part of that is going to be prioritization. Okay, look, so I threw out uh, combat culture earlier. Uh, I've also heard my Marine friends and brothers and sisters talk about treating everything ashore as if it's a combat system and a weapons platform. The Navy has done that. It needs to do more of that. It needs to do better at that. The simple reality is that uh, our combat effectiveness is going to, at some point, connect to the cloud. Uh, the cloud is fundamentally someone else's computer. Someone else's computer is hosed, is housed, and maybe hosed in a whole bunch <laughs> of brick and mortar. Okay, there is a whole bunch of wired in wireless. You're going to have to pay the freight to pull the glass, to pull the copper, to get stuff on orbit, to keep stuff on orbit, if you're going to successfully execute DMO at a distance across the vast expanse of the Pacific, where you're going to be finding success in multi-axis, simultaneous time on top for multiple shooters, where we do what we do the best anywhere in the world. And a lot of that is because of industry, extraordinary precision, and accuracy and range and capability to put it on the dimpy when we say it needs to get there. And oh, by the way, you know, our ability to deny the adversary's ability to do that, you know, you shouldn't shake a stick at that. We also need to invest in a whole bunch of that. Look, I'll just address the Volt Typhoon thing, right? Okay. Um, look, it's, they're not coming. They're already here. Right, so every single one of us, every single one of you should have an opinion about that. And I don't think I'm fear mongering, I'm just saying do a little bit of reading, do a little bit of light research and form an opinion and then think about what you like and would like the answer to be. And in my mind, just like with Sputnik, when arguably then President Eisenhower made one of his most glorious decisions, by keeping his mouth shut. And the United States, in consensus, established normative behavior in space and the, and the right of overflight in space. And if they're conducting operations in our AO, in our backyard, then maybe they're just telling us that they expect us to do the same. We need to think about and assess what normal is. Yeah, undersea critical infrastructure, or just critical infrastructure writ large, I think uh, uh, we're in denial. Uh, we're way too slow to recognize threats and way too slow to recognize uh, actions that are taken uh, after the fact. Uh, Nord Stream 2 pipeline, the Baltic pipeline, you know, some ship drags an anchor over that pipeline and then just goes home via the Arctic route. Nothing is done. Everybody shakes their head. And then we want to do the forensics to prove that, well, it was this platform or this cause or effect. Uh, we got to be a, a lot more agile and nimble. You know, uh, I love Congressman Whitman from Virginia. He's the one that sponsored the cable support ship fleet, of which we have two ships. 
750,000 miles of cable. A trillion dollars of transactions go across the Atlantic on those cables every day. What would happen to the markets if something happened to our undersea critical infrastructure? I worry a lot about that, and I think we need to get religion quickly. And as Scott Swift and I always say, it's going to take another Pearl Harbor moment, you know? And that's unfortunate. Okay. So I think I'm going to call moderator's privilege and ask the last question here. And <clears throat> gentlemen, you all have the luxury of being retired. And we've got, we've got industry assembled here today. From well, the Navy. We're still out there trying to fight the good fight in a different a way. Amen. It, it, and I'll do, and I'll do, dil, you know, uh, I'll do justice to y'all. But, but really, industry assembled here today. What advice do you have to industry? Closing thoughts that that maybe you couldn't from your uh, from your active duty chair. So we will start with you, sir. Yeah. Um, don't get frustrated by the lack of demand signal. It's not because of a lack of desire to give you a demand signal, because I hear that from my friends in industry all the time. We don't know what the building you know, DOD, OSD wants because they don't tell us. They got a lot of problems on their hands and probably one of the biggest first and foremost is a continuing resolution where you can't plan for squat because you don't know what new programs you can fund or where you want to go or whether the money is going to come or we're going to have a government shutdown. Please don't get discouraged. Please invest IRAD in national security because it's not about profit over loss. It is for a civilian company. You want to make some money. And I'm all in favor that you make money, but it's also about our national security. And that's where I think we are standing in extremis right now because we're taking the threats too lightly as a nation. And I'll stop there. I'm privileged to have an affiliation with the Naval Post Graduate School. Uh, I'm an alum, that's not the issue. I'm glad I made it through. You have almost 2,000 warrior scholars that are there. Um, they graduate about a thousand ish a year. Um, they represent some of the most brilliant and insightful thinkers that are solving problems that they experienced in their first or second tour in the fleet or in the FMF uh, or in the joint force. And however you can partner as appropriate with institutions like NPS, whether it's CRADAs or internships or deliberate research opportunities and IRAD, uh, those relationships uh, will pay out. I don't have an answer on that. There are ethics that you need to do and laws that need to be observed, uh, but there's opportunity. There's a, a, an, op an opportunity to do something different. It's not a moonshot. Uh, it's not a Manhattan project. It's something in the middle of that, and we just need to start it and keep doing it. Thank you. Yeah, I think you need to press the DOD leadership hard. You're going to see, so I'll see you know this morning, you're going to see Admiral Paparo tomorrow morning, you're going to see uh, Secretary of the Navy on Thursday. They're going to give great speeches, they're going to talk about what we need and what we ought to do. You're going to hear that from lots of leaders on panels. Uh, you will hear it at all the other uh, professional uh, symposiums that take place. And they talk about all the things we need, uh, but then that and you want to jump up and say, we can do that. We're ready to do that. We've got solutions for you. And then that's not what comes out for you to see. What I don't think is happening, now that I'm sitting on the other side of the fence helping, helping you, helping some of you, is pressing back hard. And every time that comes up and says, you know, stop, you know, stop asking the simple questions, uh, get up and say, we're ready to do that. Why, uh, why is the acquisition system not asking us? push back hard. you got to start pressing hard or we're going to have the same lame conversations that we always have with leadership. You write it down. You go back and you're talking about it. But press hard and say, yeah, but we can do that. You haven't asked us for it. It's not coming out of the system. We're ready to support you. So as the Chief Executive Officer for Strategic Insight, a small consulting firm, tiny, even though small, I have the same issues you do, believe it or not, with the acquisition system. Um, I also recognize very quickly, it's not going to change by itself, to your point. Uh, my other point is, there's an educational aspect to it, right, of, of, the, um, of what happens on the industry side when things get delayed, when there's um, uh, incomplete RFPs, when an RFP just shows up with no draft RFP, how that doesn't prep you to provide the best answer. 
And as much as in getting after the uniform leadership, the reality is, due to Goldwater Nichols, there's a secretariat piece of this as well. Good stuff, good stuff across the board. Gentlemen, thank you. Uh, we've covered a lot of ground. And you know, with, with what's going on in the world, from Ukraine to Israel to China, uh, clearly we've got a lot of work to do, collectively, as industry and, 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 and the DOD. Uh, but conversations like this, I think, help. Uh, great advice across a number of topics here, so uh, hopefully uh, you all take away what I did. Uh, but but coming away from it, I think it comes down to we've got to partner better. We've yeah. got to go. We've got to go close the gap between the industrial and the DoD kind of uh, factions and come up with a new way of doing business and and do all the things that the gentleman up here uh, kind of uh, kind of poked at and talked through. So I'm excited. Um, and, and really honored again to be on the stage with you all. Thank you so much for your time. Let's give them a round of applause, folks.